Hello, I'm Robert Walker and this is a paper that I'm going to be presenting to Astrobiology Journals in Spring 2021. And it's called, Legally, Mars Samples Need to be Sterilised if Returned Before 2040 or Isolated from Our Biosphere for Telerobotic Study. Recommend Ring Plane Above G or Geostationary Earth Orbit. So this is a presentation for the paper. This graphic summarises the main points. NASA have sent their sample cache rover Perseverance to Mars already. It's on its way as I speak. ESA have planned to send the ESA Fetch rover in 2026 with the Mars Ascent vehicle and also the Earth Return Orbiter. And the aim is to return an unsterilised sample to study on Earth by 2031 to a Mars Receiving Laboratory. However, however, NASA have not yet started the legal process and they haven't yet started building the Mars Receiving Facility. If you are not very familiar with the planetary protection literature, you might think there's plenty of time. After all, it, uh, with Apollo 11, then they returned the sample within seven years of Kennedy's speech in 1962. However, things have changed greatly since then. And the, uh, the, uh, the latest estimate that I find for the legal process is perhaps eight to nine years. But that is a very streamlined process. It's really hard to see how it could be done that way. The Apollo 11 was done in just uh, through the Outer Space Treaty, which is very weak. But nowadays, it will be done under the environmental laws to protect Earth's biosphere, and those are very strong. It would have to be a simultaneous process, because it's a joint NASA-ESA, then there's going to be a separate legal process in Europe, in the EU, and then Canada and the UK are also involved in that. And then the legal process in the United States. The study I saw only looks at the United States legal process and estimates that as eight to nine years. And then you have the international treaties, which are mentioned in that in the paper too, but they don't try to do a timeline for all those. They focus mainly on the US legal process. And if it's very streamlined, then it could be completed maybe in eight to nine years. And then you just hope that all the other ones can come along on those timescales as well. It will certainly be by far the most intricate and difficult legal challenge that NASA has ever faced for any of their space missions. Never encountered anything like that before. The Apollo 11 quarantine had no legal challenge. It was published on the day of launch of Apollo 11. It had no peer review either so its legality isn't tested. So we've never done anything like this before. And we wouldn't be able to do that now. We couldn't just return a sample and, and without first having gone through the legal process for it. They were very laid back times back then. So then if we look at the, uh, the legal process, it would take eight or nine years. The facility could be ready if it takes about 11 years to construct the facility then it, you would think that starting in 2021, you'd miss the 2031 return date. You'd uh, probably miss the next one, 2033, if it did take as little as 11 years. And then you have the legal process, then it could well be extended beyond eight or nine years. But if you're very optimistic, you could might suppose that also could be completed by 2033 if they start in 2021. However, when I did the research for this paper, then I found out that we don't actually have the technology yet. So I'll explain that. And not only do we not have the technology, but that NASA are required to know what they have to build before they start building the NASA, the Mars receiving facility. So we have to have the technology, at least know, have a rough idea of what the technology is that is going to be used in this building before they can start to build and unlock the funds for it. And that doesn't exist yet. And then 
the legal process we will find, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail, but the legal process it has a different remit from the sample return studies, where the remit is to find a way to return the sample from Mars. But with the legal process, then NASA is a proponent that is saying, we are proposing to do this. And by the precautionary principle, it's the proponent's job to show that what they're doing is safe. And then it's for the others to investigate and ask them questions. And so if NASA is not able to prove that what they're doing is safe, then the legal process will end with them being told, sorry, you have to get better a better way of doing it because you haven't proven that what you propose is safe yet. So they can't assume in advance that what they do is going to be passed even. So that's my main insight. And then if you look at the NASA, uh, if you actually look at the procedures for starting a build of something as expensive as this, probably about half a billion dollars, anything over a million dollars, they have to have an enterprise service review, an enterprise architecture review. You've got to know how you're going to service it, and you've got to know what you're going to build. And before you, uh, until you've done that, the funding is not unlocked except some discretionary funds, and the build can't start, and none of the even drawing the detailed architectural plans and things. That just can't start until you've uh, passed that stage, do you know what it is you're going to build? So these would seem to be required that the uh, build starts after the legal process. And then if that is correct, then it's 2040 is the earliest. Actually, it might well, given what the um, legal possibility of delays in the legal process, the need to develop the technology first before you can even start the legal process. Then 2050 could easily be, and then delays in the Sydney, and it could easily be that what you end up with is something that's more difficult to construct. 2050 is a more likely time. Now, so I want to explain why it is so difficult to contain it. Because if you look up, you'll find papers, even if people are quite familiar with the planetary texture literature, might be quite surprised because they can find papers saying this is how to do it. And the, these just use HEPA and ULPA filters. So what's the problem there? Well, that was uh, up until 2009, using a HEPA ULPA filter with the standard filters for a biosafety laboratory, then that would have seemed a practical thing to do. But then there was the discovery of starvation-limited bacteria that can pass through a 0.1 micron filter. And, of course, bacteria returned from Mars would be likely to be starvation-limited, very limited nutrients. And uh, a biosafety laboratory is not designed to contain starvation-limited bacteria as small as this. So that's why we can't not use one of those. Uh, there the are other reasons as well. You've got to, you can't use them as is because you've got to protect what, it from earth contamination as well. But you, uh, we're just nowhere near this technology at present. The European Space Foundation study said that it was unacceptable to have a release of about 0.05 microns. And this, their, their detailed recommendation is a one in a million chance about 0.01 microns, that is for gene transfer agents, and there was a new discovery about those as well, but I will focus on 0.05 microns. And so then if you go and look at the Eurocarry's design, then they cite this study, but they cite it as being 0.1 microns, and if you look there it's 0.01 microns, which seems to be a simple typo. And so they designed the Eurocarry's sample return study the design of the entire laboratory to return samples, but it's all based on this uh, 0.1, 1 million for 0.1 microns, and that's not what the study required. It needs absolute certainty for 0.05 microns. It's not acceptable to release a single particle that size under any circumstances. So this is rather like the Mars Climate Orbiter, which got lost because of a mix up of feet and meters. There's one group that used feet, another group that used meters, and they crashed into Mars as a result of miscommunication. So I look to see, does this technology exist? F and Alpha filters don't do it. They're not tested to that level. And so I found this filter that's designed to contain the 
COVID-19 to keep out every single COVID-19 virus. Well, to keep out as many as possible, to contain them at 15 nanometers. It happens to be precisely the same requirement as the European Space Foundation uh, study. And the answer was that it can't be done. They can only keep out their test filter, and this is, this is not available commercially. It was an experiment in a laboratory. They designed it to have a filter tested in the laboratory, and it could keep out 88% of the particles at 0.05 microns. The reason that people are able to use uh, filters, in the HEPA filters in the intensive care units, is because the virus is mainly transmitted over larger droplets, which are kept out, and because uh, our immune system, our innate immune system, is able to fight off individual viruses, so long as there aren't that many of them. So this technology doesn't exist yet, so the very first thing we'd have to do would be to develop the technology before we can even start the legal process, or at least to expect to make much progress with it. Because it's not going to be very impressive if you say, uh, yes, we're going to return this, we know how to do, we are going to be able to return it safely, but we don't have the technology yet. It's going to be quite hard to make progress with the legal process, if, if that's your stance. And then, the, because of the very dramatic reduction in size from 0.25 to 0.05 microns in just three years, between the National Research Council and the European Space Foundation study, the ESF studies say that it needs to review again. Now, eight years later, it certainly will need to review again. It needs periodic review. And this is an example. This is from 2019, and they, uh, it was a looking to see whether there could be life as small as in the uh, the Mars meteorite that at that point they thought they had these structures that looked like there could be life. And the panel that looked at the possibility of early life, so if you look, go back to this microbe, the big one, the, I mean the small one, the starvation limited one, and it's, it's, they worked out that 0.05 microns is the limits of the width of any terrestrial microbe. So it's pretty much as thin as any microbe can be. And that's because of the internal machinery of ribosomes and uh, the RNA and DNA translation of proteins and so on. But especially the ribosomes are absolutely huge. But it's impossible that this was the first life form, just like this. Because it's all interlocked together. It just can't come together. Because before you can have the ribosome, and you, you've got to uh, You've got to have the DNA, you've got to have the RNA, you've got the RNA needs to be translated by the ribosome to make the enzymes in order to catalyze the DNA in order to translate it to get the RNA to make the ribosomes, to make the uh, enzymes and so on, go round and round. And there's no way to get that started except by evolving from something simpler. So there has to have been a simpler form of life. So then if you look at the research into what form of, what, how, big the simpler form of life could be and for instance in RNA world cells with ribosomes which are much smaller and the very first life form able to reproduce exactly may have had as few as five genes and, uh, and you can take out of the cell wall and then you imagine it's stuff creation limited then you come up with 0.01 microns as these uh, size you would probably have to exclude so it's, it's entirely possible that entire region goes red on your view There's been big advances. This goes back to 1999, but there's been big advances in uh, in both the study of early life and synthetic biology since then. So the simplest approach is you have a sterilized uh, sterilized sample return. This is one way you could do it. You have these very small X-ray emitters, and they can be sterilized on the way back. And the only way, the only consume lots of power. And that way, you can return it whenever you like, as long as it's sterile. Then it doesn't matter, you don't need a special facility or anything. And you can sterilize it in, in such a way as to keep the geological interest. There's the same hydration, the same interspatial distancing, that, uh, there's the same uh, radioisotope dating as well, it's not affected by the level of sterilization for gamma rays anyway, it was the study I was looked at. The only effects they saw was that halides turned blue, clear salt crystals turned blue, and 
quartz crystals for clear to burn. You can live with that as a geologist. At least this was a geological study and you can live with that. Uh, and then you, you might, as I said you might think there's plenty of time because we look at Apollo so I'm just going to talk a little bit about why Apollo is such a is regards way not to do it. And this is a, a simple example well uh, first of all the, I, I just mentioned that with uh, Apollo then the, there were many beaches during the sample the sample uh, during this uh, sample studies. Uh, for instance, uh, a cut in a glove led to 11 technicians having to be isolated in quarantine. So you think about quarantine as being just for astronauts, it's not. It's also for technicians. So that's why I'm just going to briefly look at the quarantine for Apollo 11 and that really didn't do much at all. And this, uh, the, and then the role of executive decisions. Be, this is why you've got to be so careful with sample receiving study, with a uh, sample re receiving facility, that the people know what they're doing and you don't have these executive decisions. They made the executive decision rather than to take the capsule out onto a boat, onto a ship, that they would open it in the sea to avoid these uh, astronauts getting seasick by popping around for long in the sea while you try and get it out. And they opened the door and the dust would have gone, the interior was full of very fine dust that smelled like gunpowder and it would have gone into the ocean at that point. At this very moment, the dust from the moon has suddenly, suddenly some of it would have got into the ocean. And then they, uh, they swabbed them down with bleach. They, they threw the, uh, the suits in for the uh, astronauts to put on. And then the astronauts came out and were bobbing in the boat in the sea. And then the diver swabbed them all over with bleach and then threw the swabs into the ocean. And that was to get rid of the dust that got on their suits. And that, I mean, that would just seems incredibly naive now that that would do any protection at all. So after that, it was all symbolic. And we now, we now know there never was any risk, but that wasn't known back then. Carl Sagan published a paper in 1991, 1961, suggesting there could be liquid water on the um, lunar surface just a few metres below. And he, he says, remark the depth at which surviving lunar organic matter is expected to be localised is the same depth at which the temperature seems to be optimal for familiar organisms. And he worked out there would be water there as well. And that's just, uh, um, just a little way down uh, below the surface, half a metre, a metre or so, to depends on the depth. And this is just to show the idea, Carl Sagan's idea, that the, he thought there was a layer of liquid before it got uh, just the right temperature for liquid water and he thought that the organics could be preserved there indefinitely from the early solar system. So at that time we now know that the lunar regolith is sterile, this layer of water doesn't exist but back then they didn't know so that's why it was important to, to protect Earth. And then another thing to bear in mind is that we you, we hear about the natural, natural contamination principle that uh, rocks have been thro have thrown from the moon to earth and from Mars to earth and if there'd be anything alive in those rocks we do know some very hardy microbes that could have got here but we don't have any samples of the lunar regolith of the lunar dust that doesn't get easily transferred to earth if it did it would burn up on re-entry it would be sterilised in and it, that's even more so the case for Mars so we can't use the natural contamination principle of saying that the material has got here already. So it's if, if a hypothetical slightly different past where the moon did have life on it, then we were not protected from it at the time of Apollo. We were, we were just lucky. And it's not inconceivable that in uh, that other extraterrestrials with nearby planets, they don't have a sterile moon and their planet has, happens to have some life on it, and it's a very different kind of life, such as mirror biology, which I will come to. They return to that planet, and then if it was Apollo 11 era technology, they would not be able to do much at all. And the, their biosphere would be really devastated by it. I'll come to that in a minute. So we were lucky. We, should, we, we need to be careful now, and, and not push our luck. 
So unlike the case on the moon, we know that there is a liquid, there are liquid binds on Mars. We've actually detected them indirectly under curiosity measurements, but they're believed to be too cold for life. Now, um, I think I'm just going to, so I, I yes, it's Viking. Right, so I'll, I'll talk, I've talked, I've given quite a lot to think about here. Uh, I will stop at this point, Load, upload this as a main thing. So I'll just remind you of the main point right at the beginning, and then I'll end it, and then I'll do another short video. So the, so the main point again then is, to, to summarize what I just said, that we don't have the technology yet to build the sample receiving facility. The sample receiving facility will take at least 11 years to construct once we do have the technology. However, NASA don't, can't know in advance that they will be permitted to build it at all because they are the proponent in the legal process. And they can't assume that what they propose is what is actually built. So they can't start the build under their own requirements until the legal process is completed. Put the two together, we have to get a 2040. The simplest way to deal with this is to sterilize the return mission. I think that's the most likely thing that NASA does. However, the and, and the Mars is, is definitely not sterile. There could be life on Mars. I'll come to that in the future. So we ha have to take precautions. It is entirely possible that what is there could be something that is, is actually of a, a significant major hazard for our entire biosphere. I will explain that in the next video. So we do have to take be very careful here. And uh, so, so with this background, then the, there's the possibility of sterilizing it or it's possible to be turning it into a safe location that and it's studied by telepresence. I will look at that next. And uh, I, think, I think those are the main points. So, uh, so and I, I could look at that next and look at the way that hopefully we, maybe we can return something interesting from Mars, may even be life in the sample, how we can sort of rescue this. So they could actually, if there's something interesting such as life in it, if it's, if it's sterile for geology, as far as geology is concerned, sterilizing doesn't matter. As far as past life on Mars is concerned, then the sterilizing doesn't matter either because the rocks there have been so processed by the long time they've been on Mars and whatever we, we return, it's likely to, even the meteorites we already have, I showed you those images of what look like tiny, tiny cells, but we haven't been able to prove they are. There are multiple biosignatures and yet we can't prove it's life. It's extremely unlikely that what we return from Mars by the way of rocks from past Mars is, uh, is recognizable as life. So, uh, uh, and sterilizing it is not going to make a significant difference at all. So sterilizing is definitely an option, and I think it's mainly in the case of present day life, or if we could find some way of homing in down a really pristine past life, but it's extremely unlikely it would be so pristine that sterilizing would make a difference. And especially with a first mission without any in-situ life detection. So it's present day life is the main concern. And that's also very interesting. I'm going to suggest in the next video that actually that's very, quite a likely possibility. So in the next video, I will talk about how we can return, how, how we could safely deal with the situation where there's life in the sample. I am a generalist. I was encouraged to write this for by an astrobiologist friend. Please, if, if there's anything I've made, if I made any mistake, even rudimentary, even so, so silly mistakes, please let me know, and uh, don't 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 spare me my spare my blushes. If it were, I I don't mind being embarrassed. If you found anything wrong with what I said, please let me know, and uh, also with I hope to attract uh, experts and engineers and people who are expert in the legal process and the way the NASA things are done and so on. And please, if you if you've got any any comments at all, anything anything wrong, anything you want to reinforce, any additional information then please let me know and uh, and send a comment to the video contact me directly I will put the link to the paper in the video description and I will also uh, then you can find my contact address there on, in, the, in, in the in the paper or I, 
where you can contact me. I, I can put the my address in the in the video description as well. Please uh, get in, uh, get in touch. And uh, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed this. I'll do another short video.